What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. And wow, do we have things to talk about after a 27 to 25 victory, the Falcons victory over the rival New Orleans Saints at the Superdome. We are not at the Superdome actually right now because the Superdome, in Saints fashion, uh, <laughs> had the Wi-Fi stop working. They probably didn't want all those positive Falcon stories heading out into the world. So we are at the JW Marriott Executive Lounge. So if you happen to hear somebody playing pool behind us or you hear some Ariana Grande pumping, yeah. know that uh, that's the reason for that. But let's get back to this game here. Again, so much uh, so much fun to talk about here. Uh, I'm your host, Scott Bear. I'm here with Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim. As always, Chris Rim, I will start with you. What was your big takeaway from a game that the Falcons controlled for a long time and then lost complete control of and then gained back right there <laughs> at the end? Yeah, I thought for me the, the biggest takeaway was Arthur Smith's play calling. Um, at the end of the game, he made a call that we now know was this was the same uh, was the same play that they ran on the first drive of the game to to win the game. Um, but earlier in the game, I thought, you know, there there were probably some plays that he – probably some plays that he called that he might have wished he had back um, throughout the game. But ultimately, at the end, he made the call that set the team up to win the game. So I thought at the end of the day, it was, it was his play calling that stood out to me. Tori, what's uh... – what was your big takeaway from an absolute? It's cliche, but a roller coaster ride. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that the Falcons even pulled the game out, that they came, they come out of New Orleans with a win. I think that, <laughs> that more than anything, I think shows me that the Falcons are at least heading in the right direction. I, I think even Arthur Smith said after the game, he was like, "Yeah, it feels ugly at times, but the fact that we got the win, I mean, at the end of the day, no one's gonna remember." exactly what happened when it happened but they will remember what you know a record stands longer than a moment so it's like they at least came out with the win that that is true and we're going to talk about all that and so much more you guys know the format by now four quarters five minutes each and we're going to touch on cp's big 64 yard catch what happened in the fourth quarter and some unsung heroes from this falcons victory and also where the falcons stand Yes, they are in the playoff picture. True freaking story. We're going to get to all that over the course of this podcast. But before we do, we want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, including, yeah, this Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at Windows.com. And with that, we head to quarter number one. Now we're going to take five minutes to break down that really decisive 50, I'm sorry, 64 yard absolute dime mm -hmm. from Matt Ryan to Speed Demon Cordero Patterson. Is that what we're calling him? A Speed Demon? I mean, I, I really like our social team. They do a uh, score. Scorderell. Yeah. Like, that's my favorite nickname, uh, I think, of this season so far. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, Chris, you wrote about this play. Um, what were your, you know, kind of thoughts uh, on it, how it developed and how it was executed when they absolutely had to make a big play? Uh, Ryan and CP came through. Yeah, well, I thought it was cool to hear the the thought process behind the play post game when Matt Ryan kind of he, he kind of said how him and Arthur Smith in general for plays, Arthur kind of asked him if he likes this look and if he doesn't like it, they decide which works. And as soon as he heard this this play call, he knew that it was one that he liked. And CP also knew it was one that he liked. And if you look at the plays, you know, side by side, it was the exact same. Even even CP's uh, route was the like the way he ran it was the exact same mm -hmm. way. Planted his left foot in the ground, one step in, and just burnt the guy. Um, and the first time it was a linebacker. Second time it was a defensive back. Um, and then he tiptoed down the sideline and and took it downfield. And um, on the on the NFL Network broadcast, he said the the silence in the Superdome was, was his fate. Like, like nothing was better than that sound. Like the silence. It um, was, silence. well, it was crazy because like it was, this was my first time in the Superdome, like in new Orleans and in a saints game environment. And it was so loud, like so, so loud. And then as soon as he caught that and it, it was, it was silent. You're, he wasn't wrong at all. Yeah, for sure. And, and yeah, yeah. I just thought, um, from from that play, I thought I thought it was a it was a great play, obviously, and another example of like again uh, Matt Ryan heroics. I thought it was a great ball. Uh, he probably won't get enough credit for the ball. Um, <laughs> but, 
per usual, uh, but he put it in a good spot and, and CP does what he does. And also about CP, he um the, the, the he had 126 yards and that was the most yards he's had in a receiving yards he's had in a game since his rookie year. So he's just been on a tear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Chris, you, you've written a, a lot about Mr. Patterson over the last week, in, uh, including a, uh, a feature, a, a, a feature, full feature, on a very CP. well-timed one. Oh yeah. Now, uh, how like how does he feel about being in Atlanta's offense, being with the Falcons, and really kind of having a coaching staff and a team unlock his athleticism to this degree? Yeah, I think he I think he loves it, and and he said that in the in the future he feels like it's at home. He's only a few hours away from South Carolina, so his mom's always at the house, his sister's always at the house, his brother's nearby. Um, and, and they're always at every game. So not only is, is does he have his, his actual, you know, blood family, related family, but he has he feels at home in Atlanta. And he feel I mean, he said since the summertime, uh, since training camp, I should say, he said, who doesn't want to play for a guy like Art? So I guess we should have seen the signs then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he he is, you know, they're, they're using him a lot more in, in the rushing attack, um, as you point out to me, Scott. And then he's in this game, he, he dominated as a wide receiver. Mm -hmm. So. You know, there's something special about here, and and um, I don't know. I'm excited to see where he goes from here throughout the season. It's it's just so crazy because I, I covered him for a season when he was with the Oakland Raiders, and they would design plays to get him in space, and it was like he'd get a couple touches per game. He was more of a special teams player, and you've seen so many different teams and coaches try to unlock this guy. And I've seen him beat somebody downfield and have the ball clank off of his hands before, but now he just seems so automatic. There is something yeah. he, he talked in Chris's feature about having the not cocky, but supreme confidence in his ability. Uh, and despite the fact that he hasn't always been this type of player, but to see him now, I mm -hmm. mean, he, he, he's doing things that should captivate the entire league here. And like, this is just another another chapter in this thing. Uh, I mean, can he do this over the course of 17? I mean, he's already done it through the course of the first chunk of it. What's, right. who, what's stopping him from doing it the last half of the season? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny that back in camp, there's so much of a debate, right? Is he a running back? Is he a wide receiver? Like, like in the story that I wrote today, I, I just said, Falcons offensive weapon, yeah. Cordero Patterson said. I mean, that's, well, that's just what, what it that's is That's what now. he wants. He wants to be known as, like, you know, I think he said in the future, like, a baller. Like, mm -hmm. he's like, I, just, I don't want to be a running back. I don't want to be a receiver. I just want to be an athlete, a baller. Like, that's that's awesome. Like, that's a great quote. Yeah, and Chris, just before we run out of here, we're almost up to time, but uh, tell him about that legendary quote about him playing three different uh, positions. Oh yeah, I actually I sent I I sent that in my one of my friends sent me that in a group chat in all caps that uh, he said if uh, if if my mom could work three jobs I could play three positions. So amazing. I saw it today. Love yeah, it. absolutely did. And he was everywhere. He was huge for the Falcons. Uh, instrumental in this victory. And we're starting quarter number two, talking about that. I don't know what you want to call the fourth quarter. It God. was it was absolutely insane. I actually tweeted at one point. I'm not even sure how to process everything <laughs> that happened during the last 30 minutes during that final fourth quarter. Uh, just a Cliff Notes version for you here. That uh, in the fourth quarter with 11 minutes left, the Falcons went up 24 to six. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, with a minute remaining, so nine and a half minutes later, they were down 25 to 24. WTF, bro. <laughs> That's insane, right? Right, yeah. Like, like it, and it all happened so fast. It yeah. was like the Saints couldn't cross the goal line, and now they were making a habit of it overnight, and the Falcons' offense was totally stalled, and all these things that everybody who watched the game saw. Uh, how do you process this, Tori? You've covered this team for longer than the rest of us uh, with everything that happened, including what happened afterward where – Matt Ryan throws a dime to, to, to Patterson. They win the game on Young Way Koo's third field goal. Yeah. Third game winning field goal. Uh, absolutely amazing. How do you process it? Yeah. So I think for me, when I was kind of just decompressing after the game, it was one of those things where I was sitting there being like, you know what? Like, I have seen them lose games where they had significant leads in the fourth quarter. I've covered many of them because um, a lot of them happened last year. But it, it, in those moments, and 
when I'm looking back at last year and in those moments where they're in the fourth quarter and they are, have a team that's coming back and they have a chance to either go win it or to ice it and they can't do it. And I think the difference now is that we have seen now for three times and four times if you include the Jets game where they did ice it on a, on a final uh, drive, mm-hmm. offensive drive. If you look at those four games, those four games they have finished – I hate that word because it is such a narrative of this Falcons team and people honestly use like falconing, like, oh, they're pulling a falcon. Like it's it's such a narrative of this team. And yet this year against the Dolphins, against the Giants, against the Jets, against now the Saints, which the Saints are five and two coming in here, they have turned the narrative around. And I think the best example of, that is this game and the fact that they have one minute and one second to go down and win it essentially and and they did it like they they did it and and so I think that's why you're kind of seeing I'm spending a lot of time on this but it's because you have seen this shift in they have a confidence that they're going to go down and and punch the ball in or have Koo kick it. I mean, that that's where they are. And it, it, Arthur Smith said it best against Miami. He was like, you know, as an offense, we want the ball in our hands in the final two minutes. Mm-hmm. Same thing here. When you have an offense that's like, give us the ball so we can go clinch this thing, that's huge. As a mindset, that's huge. And it's a mindset that the Falcons haven't had in a couple years. Uh, I think that's the biggest div- – that were through eight games now. That's the biggest development of this team under Arthur Smith is that transition to give us the give us the ball, please, so we can go in. Yeah. And the, we all know that Matt Ryan's done this 41 times right. now. That's a lot. Uh, tied for seventh all time above John Elway of all people. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. My, my goodness. Uh, that he projects confidence, but he was talking about it in his press conference. Success breeds more success. Yeah. That the confidence is growing in the guys around him. And I think that's just as important as having a quarterback back there. Yeah. That said, Chris, you, you mentioned Matt Ryan and maybe him not getting enough credit for, for what he did, but now you, you, you've seen him lead all these comeback drives. Uh, what do you think has been key? Why do you think he's so good uh, in the like in these types of moments, uh, well, I think I think when you when you have a certain amount of time in the league, there's a level of comfort that I think players have that others don't. And when even defenses or, or players on your team get a little bit nervous, you have that guy in the huddle who is even killed. He's not, you know, you're not looking at it, it's your quarterback and his hands not shaking, his pulse, he's not stuttering, he's he's calm, cool, collect. He's Matt. He's Matty Ice. He's mm-hmm. Matt Ryan. <laughs> So if you're, you know, Kyle Pitts, if you're, uh, you know, Russell Gage, I guess he's been a bound for it. But if you're a younger guy, for example, if you're a guy who hasn't been in this moment and you look to your leader and he's as cool as can be, it makes everyone else also embody that. So I think that's what makes the team go in these moments. Yeah, yeah I, I think he does a good job of, of reminding everyone, do your job, whether it's protection, making a read, running a route, do your one job and minute and he has a good way of taking all of the context out of it, right? Yeah. Just execute this simple thing. And I think the projection of confidence is absolutely key. The Falcons continue to do this. Let's be honest. They would not do this with a lesser quarterback. We would be looking right. at a drastically different record without 100%. number two. Uh, and really even in this game, which could have been a disastrous loss. Instead, Matt Ryan and the offense flip the script in one giant play and go four and four with a victory over an NFC rival. We're moving on to quarter number three, and we're going to talk about unsung heroes. Tori, that was something that Arthur Smith talked about in his post-game press conference, that this wasn't all just Matt Ryan and CP that a lot of guys contributed to this one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, he literally said there are a lot of unsung heroes on this football team when you talk about this win and when you talk about what it took to get them the win. And I thought it was really, really interesting that – and I'll just read this quote because I think it's really good. It's it's Arthur Smith breaking down some guys whose names majority of – Falcons fans I guarantee you do not either a know or b even know or on this team and he said he was like you bring in James Waters he made an enormous play tonight James Waters is the one with strip sack that Stephen Means returned to the what was it 
six yard line. Right. Um, he said Mike Pinnell, he's been pretty solid. Anthony Rush, gosh almighty, he made some good plays. So those are two defensive linemen that the Falcons have brought up and have been active in recent weeks. And he said these are guys that as you continue to churn the roster, these are the guys that step up. And I think that's so important when you're talking about also what the front office is doing um, during this season. You know, you take somebody like a James Waters – that he was not on the team. He was a practice squad guy that had been elevated two weeks in a row, and you run out of practice squad elevations per the league rules, and so you have to sign this guy. So he was signed this week, and he goes out and he makes a game-changing play. I mean, you don't. You, you, this is a guy essentially off the streets. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think that's really, really important. Is I think it's what we knew that Terry Fontenot does best. He, he did it with the Saints. He finds guys who can be game changers who other people kind of tend to overlook. And I think this was such an example of that. Granted, we can talk about the defense and, and kind of not – performing as well as you wanted to in the fourth quarter but you also have to take that fir- or fourth quarter but you also have to take that first half for what it was to holding the Saints to six like that's pretty impressive and, yeah. and it, I think that part's going to get overlooked in the when you're comparing it to the fourth quarter but we also we have to look at this game for what it was through four quarters and I think you you have to look at that first half and how well this defense played in that in that regard, too. It's it's always wild to me how many Raiders connections there are on this Falcons roster, but that includes Anthony Rush, who who the Raiders signed as an undrafted free agent. And he didn't make the team out of camp, but you could just see he had a great preseason. The guy had some juice on the inside, and he obviously a, a huge body that I really thought was going to make it. And he's kind of bounced around the uh, league. He's gone to Philadelphia. He's gone to a couple different uh, places and never really landed s- solid footing. But I think he... Somehow, a practice squad guy (laughs) offers an upgrade to what they're doing on the inside. And it's those little things, right, that, that, that do change things. Sure, all the drama that you made a great point. All the drama at the end is what is what's going to be on the headlines, right? But if they don't limit the Saints to field goals early, it doesn't matter. We don't even get to that point. Right. Right. It's, it's a completely different thing. So, and Dean Pease always says, I'm paraphrasing, but yards don't matter, points do. Right. And this was a perfect – the first half, first three quarters were a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. But we're talking lots of, about defense here. Chris, what about on the offense? It's uh, the first game since uh, Calvin Ridley's been put on the non-football injury list. Um, you know, obviously we're, uh, we're, we're talking a lot about Matt Ryan and CP. Anybody else uh, jump out to you on the offensive side? Yeah, I thought uh, Alameda had a good game. And Alameda Zacchaeus, am I saying that right? Oh, yeah. Uh, OZ Alameda okay. uh, Zacchaeus. Yeah, if I'm not, John John Dighton's gonna <laughs> tell me about that. But um, yeah, he had he had a great game. Um, he, he had two touchdowns and three receptions, 58 yards, and and he hadn't scored since they played the Giants. And he, I thought his second touchdown was especially impressive because he just left uh, Marshawn Lattimore in the dust. Uh, he shook him into the back of the end zone and, and scored there. And Russell Gage, too, played well. He had seven catches for 64 yards. And earlier in the week, Gage even said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, f- to fill that role if need be that that Ridley leaves. But he also said it's not, it can't just be me. It's going yeah. to take all of us. And it was a collective effort from CP to Russ to Alameda. Um, and Kyle Pitts did his thing like he always does. But the receiving core really stepped up. Yeah, I think it was Matt Ryan who said at some point during the week, he was like, this is going to be a by committee type of endeavor type of attack and I think you absolutely saw that play out today it was really nice to see Russell Gage it was become more active he didn't have a target he's obviously had some injury issues in, in, including he was limited with the groin injury early in, in the week he's always or last year he was a third down target oh yeah quite I, I said all the time I was like Russell Gage is Matt Ryan's favorite third down target yeah and and he was on a couple of key third downs in the first half so it was nice to see him get going lots of unsung heroes in this victory um and i think it's important to point those guys out we're starting quarter number four talking about this victory and where the falcons stand after eight games and what they need to do moving forward they have a very tough game against dallas coming up next week that should be interesting but we did it again we've done this before (laughs) we did it again we typed on nfl.com playoff and then picture yeah and the web page i'm staring at is the nfl playoff picture and yeah the falcons are in that seventh seed 
I know. Right <laughs> it's now, interesting. Does, it, does the season end today? No. It it does not. As a matter we of fact, we are in week eight. Yeah, there's a long way to go, and yeah. there's a lot of tough teams coming up on this schedule. Yeah. So nonetheless, where the Falcons are, four and four at this point, your progress report and how they can. I don't know. It's hard to say build on this moving forward. It's such a week-to-week league, right? I mean, right. Like you look at Carolina. Carolina looked like world beaters last week, and they can't do anything at all. They were awful. Yeah. It blows my mind. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Back on track. Goes on tangent. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Carolina. Tori, help me stop talking. <laughs> Where do you think the Falcons are at 4-4, at four and four, uh, you know? In the, in the in the seventh seed. Yeah. So I remember before the season even started, someone asked me like, "What do you think is a good season for the Falcons in 2021?" And I remember saying then, and I still believe it. If the Falcons can stay around 500, that's a win for this team at this point in time in where the organization is with Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot coming in in year one. Um, they're at 500 right now, mm-hmm. and you know there are some games I guarantee you that they want back they want that Washington game back they want that Carolina game back but you have an opportunity going forward where you have some teams that you if you're looking at it you're like you know what like we can get some more wins is Dallas one of those teams I don't know and going to Dallas next week is going to be quite the test and I think it would be I think it'd be really really interesting to see how what Falcons team shows up on, on Sunday against Dallas and if they can be competitive with Dallas I think that's in and of itself even if they don't come away with the win I'm okay with that um, because I think that would be progress from where they were even two three weeks ago playing like Washington um, so that's where I'm at headspace wise there's a lot that has to happen and there's a lot that has to happen with other teams too to kind of for the Falcons to kind of continue to stay right there mm-hmm. but where we are right now I'm good with them being around 500. Now, obviously, the, the the Falcons seem to be on the road to a convincing victory here through, through yeah. three and a half quarters. They were cruising. I had written the lead that <laughs> got torn to shreds and never saw the light of day uh, because things got interesting at the end. But, Chris, here's my question to you, right? So they've beat the Jets and the Giants, and um, I'm spacing. Dolphins. And, and again, the Dolphins. The, yeah. the, those teams don't strike fear in many. Right. The Saints do. They were 5-2 and two entering this game. Um, does this victory mean more? Does it tell you something more, Chris, because it came against quality opposition and on the road? In, yeah, in New Orleans, too. Right. That's a big two. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think we got we have to look at it, too. And, and I think, I think sure, I think, I think it does. A, a win in New Orleans is, is a great win, but also – their quarterback wasn't the, the guy who's playing quarterback and he might not, and he might not be the guy who's playing quarterback in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, he hasn't been the guy who's been playing quarterback for most of the season. I know he played most of the game last week against uh, the Buccaneers. I'm not, not, not saying this is a, what, what I think is great about the win is the way the offense looked against the saints defense. Yeah. Yes. Right. Saints, Good point. Because the saints, you know, the, the saints defense has been so stout all year. They made Brady, frustrated last week I think he threw two interceptions last week he looked like a shell of himself and Matt Ryan just did whatever he wanted to do mm-hmm. um, against this defense which says a lot um, and I think I was most impressed by what that defense did and looking at what Teddy Bridgewater did against the Cowboys defense today right I think that for Falcons fans and people who support this team I think um, should be excited to see him this offense looking like the way they did today against this defense because that's what this team was supposed to be you know a team that can score points so if they can if the if the Falcons offense can score points I think they will win games yeah and they've been scoring a lot except for that Carolina game yeah they've been scoring a lot of points in 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 high volumes uh I you know I, I do think that at four and four is probably an appropriate record and it's a positive thing for a team that's in transition, that's yeah. learning new schemes, learning how to operate under head coach Arthur Smith, learning, 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 right? And they've made some mistakes. Sure, that happens. They have corrected some. They, most important thing, they continue to fight. There's no flinch in these guys. Uh, that's a quote from Arthur Smith uh, as well. And I think that that will help them moving forward. Who knows what their record is going to end up being, but I think that's going to help them bring out the best version of themselves and set them up, set themselves up long term for Arthur Smith to get the type of buy-in from the roster that is required for this team to really turn 
a corner and not just flash. So uh, with that, we have hit another buzzer here. Uh, that's the end of the fourth quarter. That also brings an end to the Falcons' final whistle podcast after a 27-25 to victory over the New Orleans Saints in New Orleans at the Superdome. Huge win no matter how you slice it. Incredibly dramatic. Uh, uh, Patterson even said that we don't need to give our fans heart attacks every single week. Uh, they're kind of doing that right now. Um, I saw a tweet that said uh, he hasn't been here long enough to realize that that's not funny. <laughs> the, the, and that's probably not going to change uh, anytime soon because this team wins uh, in crazy and dramatic ways. But you guys know what to do at this point, right? Head over to iTunes or Spotify, even YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. Rate, review, all that fun stuff. And be sure to tune er, be sure to download this again next week after the Falcons play the Cowboys. That's when the next episode is coming at you.